today we have the pleasure of meeting Dr. Rick Roderick, a philosopher from Duke University, who's here visiting University of Texas, which is his alma mater. Yesterday he gave us a, a brilliant lecture in my seminar, and so I asked him if he would meet me today and tell me a little bit more about himself. So we keep something of his visit with us. Rick, you are particularly interested in Habermas and the School of Critical Theory. I want to ask you some things about that. But first, I'd like to ask you about your background, where you grew up, and what it was that led you to philosophy. Well, I grew up in uh, West Texas. And uh, I think that uh, a couple of things uh, about being a Texan are interesting philosophically. Of course, for Texans believe that the topic of being a Texan is infinitely interesting anyway. But Texans uh, are, are, I guess Texans, are, it's the only state where people would have a bumper sticker that says secede. And both people from the right and the left would use this bumper sticker. So uh, I think Texans tend culturally to either identify with everything American in order to overcome a kind of cultural alienation that they feel from the nation as a large, or they tend to view themselves perennially as outsiders. And from the very beginning, uh, that was my stance. I mean, I was a troublemaker in grade school and high school. Uh, and I think that outsider's consciousness was important in shaping uh, my political views later. The oh. fact that I, that I grew up in a culture where these extreme choices were open, uh, uh, either of complete identification or of the feeling of the outsider. Is this more exaggerated in uh, West Texas? I think it's particularly exaggerated in West Texas, where uh, uh, there's a famous joke about West Texas. Uh, uh, God made too much hell, so he decided to put a little of it on earth, and that was West Texas. And so uh, w life in West Texas is, is particularly brutal particularly uh, uh, difficult and uh, the uh, stereotypes uh, that we find throughout American culture mm -hmm. are obviously exaggerated in this setting and so the consciousness of the outsider there uh, can become almost pathological that's why I, I started reading very early on mm -hmm. because I thought my, my god everybody can't think uh, realities this way so I started reading Russian novels philosophy at a very early age je simply to find someone to talk to and uh, uh, I can remember when I was uh, 14 or 15 reading uh, notes from underground and finding out that uh, right that, that I might not be totally insane I might just be in a setting where uh, where the values themselves were a little messed up so that's some of the background there plus my mother and father uh, I had the, the great advantage of having mother uh, both a mother and a father who were uh, uh, outsiders, not normal workers, who, uh, uh, you know, were, my father was a con man, my mother was a beautician, and my father was an ex-wobbly. So I had the, and, and both, and neither were Christians. So I had, I had some advantages by being raised by bizarre parents, I think, oh. which was very fortunate and lucky. Marvelous. Do they steer you toward the intellectual life? Or? Not really at all. I mean, uh, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school. So it was really a family of uh, just, uh, you know, very poor rural whites, just existing on the margins, as it were. My, my father uh, did pitch uh, some minor league baseball, and he did chain letters and other various con jobs, and, and my mother sat here. So it was very, uh, very much, an, uh, but they read books. Yes. They didn't go to school, but they read books. That's marvelous. Was there any teacher in high school that particularly aimed you toward philosophy as opposed to No, school? actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> I was aimed toward philosophy uh, by the experiences of, the cultural experiences of the late 60s. First by the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. uh, by the various assassinations, uh, by the experience of friends that I had known coming back uh, in body bags from the war in Vietnam. And I, I wanted to try to understand this situation. And uh, philosophy was just one among many things that I read in order to do this. But philosophy became particularly important because, uh, as Gay Debord once said, it is the, the thought of separate power and the power of separate thought. It is sort of at the pinnacle of the attempts to understand things in a very large way how things in the broadest sense of the term hang together. 
We have the love of wisdom, huh? And so, so it was driven, though, by passion mm -hmm. and by a horror uh, of the conditions around me to try to understand them and make some kind of sense out of them. And that's what initially led me to philosophy, as well as the way I personally reacted to it with mm -hmm. uh, uh, such uh, utter uh, outrage. And uh, that outrage was mixed, uh, to be honest, with a kind of joy. The joy that was mixed with the outrage was that I could see, as I began to see, the structures around me falling apart, I began to see the hidden past of America, the past that was there in the 30s, that was there when I listened to Woody Guthrie, which I came to after Bob Dylan, right? And I began to see a hidden past of America, a past full of promise that had been basically taken over by a bunch of shoddy insurance salesmen and techno-war bureaucrats. And uh, I began to see and feel a part of, a, of an America that's been hidden and is still hidden. Uh, and it's certainly systematically hidden at the university, well, in my we, opinion. We could get back to that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Please ask uh, no, another please. question. No, please. No, that's fine. So there was a deep love of your own country. I love America. This is the odd, yeah. the odd part about being a person who loves America but feels alienated from uh, the the power elite that's been in place since the Second World War, and and actually from many aspects of our own past, not just the power elite since the Second World War, but as John Stockwell, the ex-CIA agent, reminds us, he's sort of our version of Saul of Tarsus, uh, struck blind. As, as John Stockwell reminds us, America has fought 200 wars in 200 years. Uh, it's committed genocide against Indians, Africans, uh, and killed mass millions of people. Since we're a mobile society, unlike the Russians, the Russian gulag is static and in one place. Ours is sort of mobile, like a trailer park. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, is the ugly side of America. It's hard to love a country that is implicated in that degree of uh, both moral horror and, in, in a sense, uh, uh, horror objectively generated by a structure of which America is the centerpiece. At the same time, uh, it's hard not to love America and its promise and its, its struggle and, uh, and the culture and what it represents. So it may be like all love affairs, it's highly ambiguous. There are elements yes, of both mixed yes. in it. Well, that's fascinating. So you went to university and you studied philosophy as well as communications. Well, I, st no. uh -huh. yes. I started with communications. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I, I really uh, took courses in the School of Communication because I was busily involved in anti-war activities and the easiest major I could find was in the RTF department where you could s see a lot of movies and television and write papers about that. So my first degree was really based on finding something that I could do in order to take up as little time as possible. I see. Uh, and on the side, I took philosophy courses with my first degree. It was only later that I came back and studied philosophy systematically. So you started early 70s, late 60s? I started late 60s, 60s. Uh -huh. and, uh, and only, only actually returned to serious philosophical study in the mid-70s uh -huh. uh, after uh, the counter-revolution had succeeded in America. Uh, I did what I guess is a fine revolutionary tradition. I returned to the study to rethink uh -huh. what had happened. And so uh, the part of that process was studying philosophy, but in a very broad sense. I mean, I see philosophy as a conversation with economics, with history, with politics, with feminist studies, with race, and with everyday life. Mm -hmm. So I, I came back to philosophy in that spirit in the 70s to try to rethink what had happened, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the Reagan counter-revolution and the zombieization and the banalization of America, uh, the study looked like as good a place to be for a few years as, uh -huh. as anywhere. Or to think about the whole thing. Well, yes, and then, then also I had to find uh, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere uh, to, to raise enough money to, to uh, eat, which is one of the imperatives capitalism's always <laughs> placed upon us. And as Hunter S. Thompson says, as I told you on the phone this morning, uh, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. So I decided to become a professional philosopher. Yeah. Great. Were there, were there certain books or certain key teachers that were really important when you were Yes, there? and some of them are here still at, at yeah. Texas, and I can yes. recommend them highly. Uh, Doug Kellner directed my dissertation here and was a close personal friend. 
Lewis Mackey is another uh, delightful person who both is an excellent philosopher and is a living example of the philosophical life. And uh, so, yeah, there were important uh, teachers. But I think that it's, it's also fair to say that I never, or at least I tried not to let schooling get in the way of my education, to quote Mark Twain. And I learned a lot by meeting people outside the university and meeting other students Are and ex other people. anti-war activists or what kind of Many people? kinds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, Avant-garde artist types I've always interacted with. And I have, you know, I, Bergman film festivals, anti-war activists, uh, mm -hmm. bizarre music, uh, all of these things I took to be part of, of constructing alternative futures. So which you I were already seeking an alternative, I see. But first, I want to know why critical theory? Was it because it was well taught here, or did it offer you some kind of explanation of what had gone on and made you angry? Well, the first, the first uh, thing that drew me to critical theory was to attend a lecture by Herbert Marcuse. Uh -huh. And Marcuse combined both a, a wonderful European intellectual heritage drawn from Marx and Freud with, with a, a love and appreciation of American popular culture. Uh, it is, should be better known that Bob Dylan was Marcuse's favorite uh, artist in a certain mm -hmm. sense. And so Marcuse combined in himself many of the things that, that I saw in my own life. So at that level, I became interested in critical theory through actually meeting and encountering this famous figure. Mm -hmm. It was only after that that I began to systematically study critical theory as a way of overcoming the isolation of disciplines within universities and as a point of struggle within the university system, as well as with trying to make link-ups with alternatives in the, in, in the uh, you know, working class movement at large. So critical theory was important first through that encounter, and then later I began to read the tradition of critical theory that comes out of Lukács and Korsh. Yes. Of course, this was a, a reading subsequent to a long study of Marx. Yes. I think for the listeners it would be good if you kind of ca encapsulate what was the essential attraction of critical theory for you. Well, and describe it a little. I'm going to, I'm going to describe it in a way uh, a little different than, say, Doug Kellner would if he were here. For me, critical theory represents what Horkheimer calls the systematic unfolding of a single existential value judgment concerning the crisis-ridden nature of the capitalist system. And for me, beginning from that judgment, it represents an unfolding of that value judgment as we trace reification, domination, sexism, racism, dehumanization. As it spreads throughout the society, we trace it, and we don't respect any disciplinary boundaries when we trace it. We study television seriously, and we st study the odyssey seriously. We, we take uh, the divisions between economics, history, philosophy, to just be matters of the college catalog and the fragmentation of bourgeois society. So using that as a model for study means that one does not have a list or a sacred canon, which is racist and sexist on its face in philosophy. They're all fat, white old, white old guys, you know? So on the prima facie, it's obviously implausible that the whole wisdom of the West is summed up by 11 fat, white, old guys. This is prima facie implausible. Critical theory gives us a way to try to make connections to see why that's the case and to understand philosophy in this broader sense and to use it to bring together people who are interested in alternatives, in real alternatives. I mean, mm. among the real alternatives are utopian hopes, dreams, daydreams, fantasies, wishes, the voices that are silenced, the voices of women, mm. of blacks, of yellow people. I mean, after all, most of the world isn't white, isn't male. This is a very idealist interpretation of the Frankfurt School, for example. Certainly it is, because this, this is an interpretation <clears throat> that breaks decisively with Adorno's pessimism. Mm -hmm. I myself uh, find Adorno's pessimism terribly attractive, so I react against it violently. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to see this contradiction in myself. I think. The Adorno of Dialectic of Enlightenment is one of the most seductive, brilliant intellectual figures of the 20th century. And the only response to it has to be, in my view, uh, uh, one based on the practical postulate that if we take this seriously, then there's no hope. And the response to that is Bloch's response, is that reason and humanity cannot flourish without hope. 
And so this is a practical postulate of action and not a theory. Mm -hmm. So this response comes from that level. Uh, I don't deny the power of that. Uh, mm -hmm. The same contradiction appears in, in British uh, Marxism when E.P. Thompson on the one hand writes the redemptive history of the working class and on the other hand writes an essay called Exterminism that shows how we're doomed by technical uh, systems of power to extinction. The same duality appears in my own thought, but my reaction to it is never to give up because that becomes a self-fulfilling uh, form of behavior. To the extent that we feel paralyzed, to the extent the social critic succeeds in paralyzing us, which in a way is his job, is to paralyze us with horror. This appears in Foucault, where the world looks like a prison. It appears in Thompson's exterminism. It appears in Adorno in a highly sophisticated form. Uh, to the extent he succeeds in doing that, which is the critic's job, he contradictorily loses by paralyzing us for action. And the response to this paradox is not itself a theoretical response, but should be an activist response. Uh, this may have taken us to the very edges of critical theory, but... Uh, uh, in this regard, this is what led me to Habermas, is Habermas was attempting to find uh, responses to the dialectic of enlightenment, to the way enlightenment had generated a world full of nuclear weapons, instrumental reason, and the disappearance of the bourgeois subject, mm -hmm. what we used to call people. Yes, okay. yes, yes. It's a, it's a marvelously Texan response, it seems to it's me. It's Texo-Marxism in a way, I think. <laughs> no, but there's the elegance of Adorno's way of presenting things and the elegance of his grand world vision. But on the other hand, the lack of hope at the end of it is what really stirs you to respond. And yeah. I, I think it does. Yeah. I mean, it has to. You wrote your dissertation on Habermas, yes? I can explain mm -hmm. that. I mean, a lot of people have asked me why anyone who is as bizarre as you would have written on a person is in love with reason as Habermas. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons I wrote on him was at the time, uh, many leftists uh, were going to Habermas as a source for sustenance and for academic careers. There was, it was virtually an academic cottage industry. So my book on Habermas was, was meant to be a dialectical critique of Habermas, mm -hmm. where I'd both give a positive evaluation of Habermas's attempt to return to the critical theories of the 30s, mm -hmm. to return, as it were, to this supradisciplinary structure and to try to re recover moments mm -hmm. of, for him, reason, mm -hmm. for me, revolt, uh -huh. to use a, fi a, a famous uh, distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, but this attempt seemed to me laudatory. On the other hand, Habermas was clearly operating in a West German political climate that is so repressive that just defending John Stuart Mill and Walter Mondale is a radical act. So I wanted to critique him so that we wouldn't uncritically take over Habermas's radical analysis for America, where it's perfectly represented by the left wing of the Democratic Party, and that needs no theoretical support since it has some support you know, in the media and other places. Mm -hmm. So it was a dialectical critique that showed both the strengths and the limitations. I also wanted to warn people against reading Habermas as the obvious theoretical outcome of a tradition that I still believe is better represented by Marcuse, Bloch, and Benjamin than it is by Habermas. For an American audience, certainly. For an American yes. audience, without question. Yes. I mean, we have to remember Habermas is defending reason mm -hmm. in a situation where German historians are saying, forget Auschwitz, we fought the Russians, we're with NATO. And he has to respond to people who think in this way. So naturally, his response is uh, he begins with very moderate uh, concepts like consensus, mm -hmm. liberalism in the Deweyan sense. Mm -hmm. And that's not always a bad place to begin in America in the aftermath of Reagan. But that's only a start. I mean, this is only to get people to listen who otherwise would simply mm. tune out. It's only the beginning. But remember yesterday I asked you how such a, a globalizing, globalist type uh, approach to things, such as Frankfurt School and even Habermas, um, could, could be digestible in, an, in an, a philosophical environment of pragmatism such as America. Well, it's, so, it's, it, it is, in one sense, I don't even want it to be digestible in the sense that I think that the Hegelian concept of totality, mm -hmm. of understanding literally everything about everything, uh, is an illusion and a dangerous one, politically and theoretically. 
But on the other hand, the attempt to understand the macro level, the attempt to get some sense of what's going on in the world, is something the right is quite good at. I mean, Oliver North was a master dialectician. He had the whole world mapped out in conspiracies, and things were flowing from country to country, and this was all based on a worldview. It had it, theory and practice were combined, and and. Uh, so there's a level at which we want to attempt to understand the large picture without turning it into some grand theory that shuts out, or in an elitist way, the moments of difference, of non-convergence with our theory. So there's that moment where I want to defend a larger view without falling back into the, the older trap of the totality, which was theoretically criticized beautifully by Adorno and, and others. On the other hand, the only meaning that theory can have uh, in my tradition is the meaning that the practical struggles of human beings gives it. Where that is absent, my theory is absent. Where that is present, my theory is present. So, so I want to, no strategy that doesn't ultimately appeal to the, to, to the finite struggles of human beings to come together and achieve real freedom, concrete freedom, not philosophical freedom, but things like more, f more time, real free time, not, quote, leisure time, but real free time, real creativity. Uh, and in many parts of the world, simple things like food, mm -hmm. clothing, shelter. Because before we can have what no human beings have ever had, which is real freedom, mm -hmm. we need to have at least what every human being should have, mm -hmm. which is food, health, housing, mm -hmm. free baseball games. But this is all like very fine uh, if, if we were to accept a materialist definition of life and meaning and mm. freedom. Suppose I were to say to you, uh, maybe the biggest need is for contemplation, for uh, spiritual uh, reflection and so on. Would your critical theory have a space for me? Uh, not only would it have a space, but I hope that, that if I've listened to your question and I've tried to listen, one of the things that male academics don't often do is listen. But if I've listened to your question, uh, that my rejection of the older notion of totality means I'll listen to this. And precisely here is where Marxism becomes implicated with its enemy. I mean, in a way, capitalism disguises the world and says all needs are economic. Mm -hmm. And we as its enemies go, they're right, all needs are economic. That's just false. And so to listen to non-acquisitive cultures like the culture in India, to listen to women when they say, look, my needs aren't all like for the latest fashion. I have a need for compassion, for tenderness. Mm -hmm. uh, if critical theory can't make a place for this, I'd rather throw away the theory than these other uh, things. So my, my own view can. Mm -hmm. Whether I can do this consistently, I mean, whether this can be done theoretically consistently is not to me even of importance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I take the, the, the typical philosophical obsession with deductive consistency to be itself uh, uh, you know, an incredible yes. example of both the political and sexual unconscious at work. Uh -huh. So I mean, uh, I, this okay. is, yeah. I hope I've listened to your question. Yes, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, really, because it seems to me the emancipatory aims, which were certainly there at the beginning of the Frankfurt Movement and certainly in Marx, uh, I read in Habermas, and it leaves space for those other dimensions of being, the quest for freedom, different parts of humanness that have been silenced. Uh, so I was hoping that it would be part of your vision. Certainly. And so I wanted to lead into the final question. I, understand, I understood yesterday that you share my malaise about the structuralist critique of action, agency, which Marx has always stood for mm -hmm. and the Frankfurt School. Yes, uh, you, you're pretty angry at the movements in, recently in France. Well, I think that, that uh, on the one hand, I, I I have, this, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with France, too. They do wonderful things like May 68. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in my own life, this is an incredible event. The first Western industrial nation brought to a standstill by a revolution where no one is killed, where, where they're defeated at the level of the totality of society. Mm -hmm. They're defeated in the factory, in the streets, and in everyday life for two months, okay? But the failure of this experience then calls forth the same kind of totalizing response, an absolute nihilism, well, we tried it. We... And this is to be a 
terrible historian of any kind because everything that appears in history doesn't appear all at once in all of its glory, complete, final, and, and succeeded all at one time. Surely we've learned that. Things appear, they disappear, and then they come back in a fuller form, and so on. And this is, so I think that, that the fact that the expectations were so great and then disappointed means that a lot of new French theory takes as a local situation a universal, a universalizing negativity in this case. What was a universalizing positivity now becomes caught in the universal negative again. Well, we, we tried. It's over. And, and that attitude, you know, is part of the conservative counter-revolution in France in West Germany, in America. But at the same time that that's going on, there are peace movements, the women's movement continues, where there are working class movements. For example, I take it to be the fact that the major unions are losing membership is, is in a sense a positive uh -huh. thing because uh, American workers no longer see their interest as represented in purely economic terms by these bureaucrats. And so all these things are going on around us and uh, we take one beautiful expression of revolutionary uh, uh, history, of revolutionary life, and its failure and just say, well, that's it. But, but I don't want to draw either the positive or negative universalist thesis from a local experience. Well, you, you just challenge us to look for hopeful signs of new birth, emancipation. What sort of advice would you offer to students and colleagues about how to how to mold our praxis uh, in an emancipatory way? Have you? Well, I, one of the things is that I think we should, and this is, this is deep in the American tradition, we should be more critical. Mm -hmm. We should ask questions like, why do the humanities dehumanize us? Why, once I have got my degree in the humanities, am I less human than when I started? <laughs> why are all my humanist teachers actually nihilist, people who believe in nothing? I mean, we should start with basic critical questions. Uh, a student, for example, in a class, in my view, the first thing he should ask is he should look at the syllabus and go, why in the hell are we reading this? What good are these books? Why should I read them? And so at, at that very mundane level of student life, uh, you know, my advice would be they don't have to follow it. I want them to do whatever they want to do, mm -hmm. find their own forms of struggle. But I think a beginning here is to realize the poverty of student life, mm -hmm. that you're an unpaid worker. In fact, you're paying to work. And you're working in a, an atmosphere where the university has really turned education into a very poverty-stricken experience. And so at this level of university struggle, I think students could play a large role simply by being more critical of the system, which uh, uh, doesn't even give them internally what it promises to give them. You take a degree in the humanities to be, quote, well-rounded. This appears in all the cruddy little speeches at commencement. Well, you could start by saying, how come that's not happening? And uh, What about teachers? Teachers, uh, this, is, this is very difficult because... Uh, on the one hand, you stand in front of a classroom, so you're already placed in a context of authority, of power. You're part of a disciplinary structure. Mm -hmm. Part of your job is to normalize students. You're, you are the soft side. You're like a prison guard, except you're the, you know, like the two cops, the tough guy and the soft guy. Well, the, the university professor in, in one aspect is like the soft guy. You're trying to normalize them in a very nice way. Well, you stand in that objective structure, and so there's a paradox in denouncing it from the outset. The only way I've ever been able to resolve this is to quite bluntly say, don't leave my class saying, strike out against all authority based upon the authority of Rick Roderick, that this is paradoxical, to find your own form mm. of struggle, questioning, of living more fully, and I've had some good response to that. But there's no reason to deny the paradox that you have been placed for reasons that may be large ones. I mean, one reason that I think there's been a sort of rebirth of certain kinds of critical studies, women's studies at the university, is that the bourgeoisie themselves see the poverty of their educational uh, enterprise. And it's quite important for modern capital to produce knowledge. So on the one hand, they need us. Mm. and they implicate us in power. And, but we have to be aware of that paradox and make our students aware of it and to prove our authenticity to them. I've found this to be very important, is that, they, that students observe 
the connection between how you speak and how you act, a connection that I advise them to observe. Yes, but, but you are an exception to your own theory of university as prison, and I hope I am too. Uh, wouldn't there be many others who are exceptional? That I would think, no, no, there's no doubt about it. I'm just saying that, that we need to recognize that the student has every reason mm -hmm. to be suspicious of an authority who says, don't believe authority. Mm -hmm. They have a reason to be suspicious, and our way to meet that suspicion is by recognizing that paradox and then acting authentically on your mm -hmm. commitments. Uh, but I, no, I mean, I think that there are people, many people throughout the university and the information sector mm -hmm. of, the, of, of modern life who, uh, who share uh, an, a, an attempt to try to find alternatives and so on. And I don't want to say or do anything theoretically to stand in their way. There are many levels, heterogeneous levels of struggle, mm -hmm. Because once capitalism invades the whole of life, and that's what I take to be the latest stage, is marketing us from our micro desires all the way up to consciousness in the form of TV, magazine, mm -hmm. the whole of life. Well, then struggle also involves the whole of life, from the university to our everyday relations with people mm -hmm. to politics and across mm -hmm. the whole spectrum. So, so I don't want to say in advance what any of these heterogeneous struggles, I don't want to limit them by anything I say. I just want them to flourish. Yes. And I will help them flourish wherever I can. And I, I hope this attitude spreads because we're in a period where Reagan's hegemony and the hegemony of the counter-revolution is delegitimizing all around us, mm -hmm. it, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Yes, well, that's You got me excited with yeah. the question. I'm sorry, I just... No, I think you, you give us a, a challenge. You give us a, a spark of hope about the future. We may disagree with some of the things you believe in. I hope so. And take our own <laughs> roots. But anyway, Rick, thank you very much for coming this morning. And I know that my students and colleagues are going to enjoy meeting you again on the screen. Well, thank you very much for asking me. And I've, I've had a wonderful, uh, wonderful time this morning. Good. Thank you. <laughs>